dear, dear conference participants, dear speakers, now we have the final session for of this day, yes, and it is called Artificial Intelligence Ethics, Regulation and uh, uh, Legal Challenges. Now um, I am Rita Remikene, senior researcher from Vilnius University Law Faculty, and it is pleasure for me to um, invite the first speaker, Goda Latushinskaya. Goda uh, Latushinskaya, PhD uh, student, and uh, she will be the first. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Neringa and the team, for this uh, amazing conference and for the opportunity to share a glimpse into my research with all of you today. My name is Goda Strikaita Latushinska, and I'm affiliated with Vilnius University Faculty of Law as a PhD candidate as well as a lecturer. And uh, today I would like uh, to talk about. Um, the use of AI systems in courts, with a special focus on the use of AI in adjudication. So in a sense, I will follow and dive a little deeper uh, into the discussions of AI in adjudication. Um, so this will be like a continuation of a keynote speech that uh, we uh, received uh, today uh, at the beginning of the conference. So uh, basically the aim of my presentation is to explore the role of AI in judicial decision making with a focus on identifying the European approach in this regard. And in order to reach that aim, my presentation today will be divided into five uh, big sections. So the first section will be about AI in adjudication and about uh, two main roles that AI can have in, in the decision making process. Then I will talk about the European approach to AI in adjudication, focusing on some key documents of uh, AI in courts in general, and then on the European approach on uh, AI in adjudication. Uh, then I will discuss the potential for AI systems to support judges in decision making while maintaining the human overview that was uh, repeatedly uh, discussed in, uh, in various uh, presentations already today. And then I will talk about the potential for AI systems to replace judges in decision making altogether. And I will, f uh, I will finalize this presentation with some concluding remarks and some takeaways um, of, uh, of, of this presentation. So um, AI in adjudication. So while uh, robot judges are still not created and are still in the making, uh, many scholars discuss that maybe we shouldn't ever de like, uh, delegate um, uh, the decision-making role to artificial intelligence, while others suggest that uh, in the future AI can, be, can beat humans in this activity and can be more efficient and provide better rulings than, human, than humans can. So uh, while most of the uh, initiatives of AI in adjudication come from outside Europe, uh, European Union strives, uh, many institutions in the European Union strive to become leader in, uh, in human-centric AI. And this is why we must talk about both um, roles of AI in adjudication and those being AI as a decision support tool and as AI being the decision-making tool or so-called robot judges. So when we talk about AI as the decision support tool, uh, what we mean is that basically uh, AI works in a, as an assistant. So it can uh, assist judges uh, with uh, making some predictions about how a certain um, case can be resolved. And then based on those predictions, they can provide some draft judicial decisions that, and uh, what is important to note here, that judges retain full discretion here, so they can uh, agree with this recommendation by AI fully, partially, all, or disagree 
at all with that decision and draft a decision by themselves. So what is important to note here is that judges retain discretion and the judges remain in control and that they bear the responsibility if something goes wrong. So some examples, we already have some examples of such systems in, in, in the world. So we have uh, the COMPO system, the Victor system, and the CDCRS system that is uh, uh, in, in China, and there are some more examples. Now turning to the right side, we have decision-making tools. And with these, uh, we have AI autonomously replacing human judges in adjudication altogether. Uh, meaning that AI is issuing some binding decisions and this model is considered disruptive technology because it changes our, pers our perspective on decision-making process altogether because this, no, this is no longer just a supportive tool, we have a disruptive technology that changes our perception. And uh, so such systems are capable of I, I independently conducting court proceedings without any human intervention. And despite uh, some issues, AI is very prom uh, prominent and uh, is becoming more and more capable. So uh, this is the reason why we should, uh, in my opinion, talk about, um, be we, why we should be proactive and talk about uh, robot judges even now. So um, to conclude this, uh, this first section, um, although we already have some examples of AI uh, as a decision supporting tool, we should also talk about AI as a, a decision making tool because um, AI is getting more and more prominent. Now I will talk about the European approach and I will try to be very quick. I was, ho I was planning to overview all these documents on the, on the screen, but I will jump right into the, um, uh, right into the documents. So there are some three documents, they all were adopted in 2019. Uh, and they all co concern uh, the use of uh, AI in justice in general. Uh, and they all say, uh, I will start with the first one. I will briefly say that it recognized AI as a key technology for improving justice, but it said that there are some drawbacks of, um, of the use of AI in courts. And then we have um, down the uh, European ethical, ch ethical Charter on the use of AI in judicial system, it says that uh, AI was again um, uh, recognized as an important uh, an, an th tool that can enhance efficiency and quality of justice, but it was noted that among other key principles, it should, uh, now look at the point number five, number five we, uh, the principle of uh, under user control must be adhered, and uh, then we have the communication um, um, artificial intelligence for Europe, and it also emphasized the need for the public sector to harness AI in areas like justice as well. And they also said that we they will invest uh, uh, in some in, in these tools and in, the, in these projects and initiatives. And also for the first time, it was the dualistic approach to AI was uh, introduced, saying that while we must promote innovation, we also must respect fundamental rights. Uh, and this is. Uh, in the future will be, we will see that this, this uh, was considered the European approach to AI in justice. Then we have two more documents, so I will briefly say that, uh, uh, review the most important uh, notions. Uh, so in the first document in the white paper on uh, artificial intelligence, the need for a solid European approach was recognized. Um, and then um, uh, it was said that in their high-risk applications, such as justice sector, human oversight is among the most essential safeguards. Then we have another document, um, a communication, uh, digitaliz digitalization of justice, a toolbox uh, of opportunities, where it was said that uh, AI applications in the justice sector can be highly beneficial, but they pose significant risks, and they over overviewed those risks, and that uh, we must adhere to fundamental rights. Now turning to some more European Union documents on AI in adjudication. The first one is 2019 ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. So among seven key requirements uh, for AI to be deemed trustworthy, human oversight was mentioned. And then uh, it also was mentioned that human oversight helps um, un uh, undermine human autonomy and causes uh, or, or causes or other adverse effects. It was also, uh, this was also already talked about, but that there are different approaches, how 
uh, human oversight can be um, can be uh, implemented. So it can be either human in the loop, human on the loop, human in command, and that stricter governance. Uh, uh, and testing are required when human oversight is limited in, in AI systems. Then we have the 2019 communication, and it says it said that human oversight helps ensuring uh, that uh, AI system doesn't undermine human autonomy or causes other adverse effects, and that human oversight is essential to prevent um, um, uh, to prevent harm to people. Uh, then we have the white paper on AI, which also emphasizes that human oversight can take different forms, and you can see them listed on the screen. And uh, they also said that um, AI injustice um, is a high-risk use case, so we must uh, take extra caution here. And that AI tools can support but not interfere with judicial decision-making and judges' independence. Then we have the 2020 communication uh, digitalization of justice, and these two, uh, I will only read the two highlighted um, um, uh, notions that final decision making and justice must remain a human driven activity, and only judges can ensure genuine respect for fundamental rights. Then we have four more documents, so uh, I will try to be very brief. Uh, so in the first document, you can see that uh, the, the main idea is that AI shouldn't autonomously make public sector decisions significantly impacting citizens' rights and obligations. And I think we all agree that uh, judges uh, making decisions or the, the decision making in general has a significant impact on citizens rights and obligations So it should be applicable and that AI should never replace humans then we have the 2020 council conclusions with all, uh, where it was also said that human uh, uh, Court decision must always be a human made uh, human being uh, uh, must be made by a human being and cannot be delegated to AI then we have the ODR um, um, guidelines which also emphasize the need to supplement but uh, not uh, uh, replace human judges and tradi in traditional court proceedings and that ODR should be seen as aid and to, as an assistant rather than a replacement and then we have the 2024 AI Act where um, uh, it was uh, emphasized that AI systems assisting judicial authorities in interpreting facts and law are high risk but this excludes administrative tasks, such as, uh, for example, anonymization and some simple tasks. So in high risk uh, systems uh, have sp specific requirements that they must meet and a proper human oversight is one of them. So to conclude these, um, we can see that the European approach says that while uh, the use of technology, including AI, is very highly um, encouraged, um, AI should only be deemed as a tool and not um, a supplementation of, uh, 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 not a, a, a uh, like to, 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 to replace uh, judges in the decision making process. Now I will briefly overview the potential for AI systems to support judges in decision making. So I will briefly say that this is in line with the human oversight requirement that I just uh, talked about. Uh, also, the human oversight principle ensures that judges retain responsibility so we have someone responsible if something goes wrong and it, it is easy to uh, to link back to, to, to a judge then it says that promoting AI uh, AI systems to assist rather than replace judges aligns with the uh, court's prerogative to administer justice through human decision making so for example we have uh, this notion in the Lithuanian constitution that only judges uh, have the prerogative to administer justice and uh, the final notion in this regard is that even mo even the most sophisticated AI systems cannot handle hard cases. So f even for now, the, mo uh, the state of art uh, uh, is that uh, AI can only assist sh uh, would be able to assist judges only in easy cases. Then potential for AI systems to replace judges in decision making. Um, there are some. Um, some ideas I would like to share in this regard. So the first one being that the current European approach reserves judgment on autonomous AI and adjudication, but we should remain open-minded about future technologies. Because now turning to the second point, successive ways of AI um, show that machines can outperform humans in tasks like predictions and complex reasoning suggesting future AI could excel in judicial decision making. That's why we should be open-minded about yet uninvented technologies that could uh, that could be very sophisticated. And 
naturally the third point that as technology evolves, society's comfort with delegating tasks to AI will increase, which means that people will be more comfortable trusting these more sophisticated technologies. And in the future, AI systems might analyze facts and apply law and, uh, and so on better than humans, forcing legal systems to adapt while protecting fundamental legal principles, because getting back to the slide, patients don't want neurosurgeons, they simply want help. So we will have to consider that as well. Uh, now I will try to conclude, uh, conclude <laughs> my presentation uh, with some ta uh, takeaway notes uh, and to summarize what I talked about. So uh, while we can see that there are only, uh, already some examples how AI can be used to support judges in adjudication, the possibility of AI fully replacing human judges in adjudication is still met with caution. And the European approach emphasizes human oversight, ensuring AI supports rather than replaces judicial authority. However, in Richard Siskin's words, I believe that lawyers, judges, and policymakers should be both humbled and open-minded about as yet uninvented technologies. Thank you very much. And, uh, in case we won't have any time to, 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 to chat and to discuss, please reach out to me. I would love to, I would love to chat. Thank you. Thank you, Goda, very much for your interesting speech and uh, valuable, you know, insights uh, to A. Now the second is Laura Centeno Casado, researcher officer from European Institute of Public Administration. Is this one working? Yes, perfect. Yes, this is good. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers and especially the students. Uh, when I submit this abstract, I was a student assistant at the place that I'm working right now in the European Institute of Public Administration. And I was a master's student at Maastricht University thinking about how my master's thesis could make an impact in society. So then I decided to submit this abstract and I would like to thank uh, Neringa Vilnius University for promoting young researchers to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about matters that really, uh, we really care. So here we are going to talk today about artificial intelligence and the fundamental right of non-discrimination. But it's important also to know about the topics of the panel that we are talking about. AI ethics, regulation, and legal challenges. And non-discrimination is a very important fundamental right because here we are talking about ethics we are talking about the UAAT. Here, I'm going to talk about the UAAT. <laughs> and also, the legal challenges addressed with this uh, conceptualization of the fundamental right of non discrimination. So, for doing that, I'm going to tell you uh, a story. But before I tell you this story, only, uh, I would like to also emphasize that non discrimination is the legal configuration of the bias. When I, why I'm saying that? Because data bias leads to, sometimes, often, much more, much more than often to discriminatory outcomes. And this has effects on society. So here, we need to seek, as legal scholars, legal uh, protection, but also legal remedies. And this should be our goal. Why? Let's go with the story. I'm coming here with uh, that city case, this ruling, uh, this situation happened in the Netherlands in 2020 even before the UAAD was even a proposal from the Commission. So here, four years ago, the, um, that uh, Ministry of Finance um, created a law that allowed an uh, AI system to process data from uh, citizens to detect if there was tax fraud or not. So this system, machine learning system, um, that leads in a more concrete configuration to an AI system was an automated welfare fraud detection system. And this is a practical example of the possibility of perpetuating and amplifying exi existential societal bias and discrimination. Why? Because when this system that was introduced in a national law 
was producing outcomes. So you have this loan, you don't have this loan, you, don't, you have this subsidy, you don't have this subsidy because of this, 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 and this. This automated decision making led to discrimination. So civil society said, now we are going to go to the court and we are going to claim that this system is biased and therefore these outcomes are discriminatory and this law should be, this system shouldn't be allowed by this law. So they went to the court, the district court of The Hague, and the, uh, here this case presents two different positions. The public interest from the uh, Dutch ministry, so I need to use the AI, this AI system because it's efficient and it's helping me to prevent fraud. And on the other hand, we have the risk, the risk of uh, privacy and the risk of uh, non-discrimination. Why I'm talking about privacy and non-discrimination? Because here we are talking about human rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, because there is, at that time, there was no a EU law, which is the case in the UAE that I'm going to explain afterwards, that uh, could protect fundamental rights in this regard. Here we are talking about human rights. So the European Convention of Human Rights is binding in, apart from all the states of the European Union, from also other uh, states of Europe, and this is the only human rights binding, um, let's say, mechanism that we had at that time. So here the court recognized that the risk caused by this bias to the system so, uh, this bias based on socioeconomic status and immigration background were a breach of human rights. Right to private life, life which is in the Article 8.2, and also this right was linked with the prohibition of non-discrimination in the Article 14 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And the court claimed that the government indeed had breached these two rights and therefore this system was an all and it was not used anymore by Dutch government. So having this story in our mind, then let's dive in the European Union legal framework. What we have is the Charter of Fundamental Rights from 2000, next year is going to be 25 years of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and here we have another configuration on non-discrimination in the Article 21. Here we have two main features. First of all, the grounds of discrimination. So the grounds of discrimination, we can link them with the bias of the AI systems when they process data. So bias in terms of sex, race, color, ethics, social uh, origin, language, religion, many, many different back, uh, grounds of discrimination that are, some of them are protected in directives um, that we have in our EU law system. Also, it's important, within the scope of the application of the treaties, this means that all the potential discriminations that can be made by EU institutions or in the member states applying and implementing EU law that is going to affect directly or and directly individuals or particular groups. So this is part of EU values. And what is very important also for the people that don't have a legal background is that you cannot just go to the court and claim, look, you have reached my fundamental right and there, therefore I'm going to go to the court. No, it's part of the EU values. You can base your claim in the fundamental rights, but you also need to claim a breach of a EU law instrument, especially regulation or directives. So this is also important to take into account that. Also, another aspect is that the Charter of Fundamental Rights has the same value that the treaties. It's part of the EU values, but you cannot only uh, use your claim saying, oh, there's a breach of fundamental rights, let's go to the court. It doesn't work in that way. So this is uh, very important for the, for the people that here don't have a legal background to know this difference. So here, now we have EU fundamental rights, but also we have a framework, which is something that, that we didn't have when that city case happened. We have the regulation and this regulation, the UAAT, you know, was part of the political approach saying, okay, this is going to be the most important legal source that we are going to have in Europe to ensure that AI is going to comply with fundamental rights. If you check all the interventions from leaders that were negotiating the UAI Act, you are going to talk, we are going, you are going to know 
the the approach that they followed and this f approach was based basically on this regulation is going to protect the fundamental rights so here the question is very simple can the UAE deliver on its promise to protect and guarantee to individuals the fundamental right of non-discrimination well here we have two main instruments first of all the risk-based approach I guess that all of you are familiar with this par pyramid and here you have two things first of all you have here the, if you see the examples of different uh, AI systems that are prohibited, high risk, limited risk, minimal risk. And also on the other hand, you have um, the impact that these systems can have. So here we have the examples and we have the impact. And here, non-discrimination plays an important role in two categories, prohibited AI systems, which is in article five, and high risk AI system, which is in article six. So uh, this is the approach that uh, is the, the EU uh, risk-based approach. And if it's going to have a Brussels effect, which means that it's going to also be followed by other legislation, it still needs to be foreseen. But maybe it's the direction that some other legal frameworks are going to follow. So here, the UAE Act, important again, prohibited AI practices, social scoring, if we link non-discrimination with social scoring, it's likely to happen, you know, how are you going to base your social scoring? Which grounds are you going to use? Maybe these grounds are discriminatory? Okay, let's make it simple. Let's prohibit it, these AI practices. Because it's a direct breach of EU fundamental rights. Then, if we go to high-risk AI systems, open question, the Dutch Siri case which uh, category do you think that could be fulfilled? Prohibited or high risk? Just think about it and we can discuss it later. But it's most likely to be high risk because if, you, if we go back to the high risk AI systems, these AI systems are uh, related to access to employment, education, and public services. And this system was to prevent uh, tax fraud. So it was related to public services. So indeed, this um, a system will fall under the category of high-risk AI systems. Okay, it falls under high-risk AI systems. What we need to do? Conform certain obligations, conformity assessment. So this conformity assessment also includes, and this is why also non-discrimination is important to analyze this uh, right on detail, is the fundamental rights impact assessment in Article 27. But this is not going to be the only assessment that is going to be needed. Because here, we are also missing one dimension that maybe we didn't tackle around the presentation, and it's data protection. If all these systems process personal data, apart from the fundamental right impact assessment, it should be needed a data protection impact assessment that you can find in the Article 35 of the GDPR. Because the, uh, these assessments are needed because when we are talking about high risk AI systems that process personal data, we are also talking about high risk data processing operations. And this leads to the last point of the UAI that we need to take into account when we are talking about the configuration of non-discrimination, and is the supervision and enforcement of the national public authorities or bodies. Here we are talking about the market surveillance authorities that need to assess if these systems can be categorized under these categories and the obligations uh, connected with these systems. Supervision and enforcement, Article se uh, 77, is still need to be foreseen. We are working now in the at EU level in codes of conduct, but it's not enough. We need to really establish the different uh, mechanisms that we are going to have for supervision and enforcement. For your information, when EU institutions want to deploy an AI system, the institution that is going to assess and supervise them is the European Data Protection Supervisor. At member state level, it could be two models, data protection authorities that also will have these uh, competencies added, or a different body, which is, uh, for instance, in Spain, we have separated, we have the data protection authority, and we have the AI office that is going to supervised at, at, uh, at the Spanish and me member state level, because also at the commission we have an AI office that has other competences. But just for supervision and enforcement, you can have 
all the supervision and enforcement centralized in the Data Protection Authority with different competencies or two different bodies. But these di bodies need to be coordinated. So conclusions for this. CE is an example of the potential damages that data bias can produce in reality. Here we are talking about a real case scenario. The presentation that we had before was really useful because she was uh, describing the consequences of the data bias. Here you have a real case. The UAAD, now we have more preventive mechanisms. Preventive mechanisms. So it still to need to be foreseen in the future if what is going to happen if we have this situation again. Also, this connects with the second point. If these safeguards that we are talking here, these assessments, all of these obligations that we have here, are going to be efficient enough. And here it's very important to distinguish between prohibited AI system and high risk AI system. And this is a task for the uh, market surveillance authorities providers and employers. So this analysis, to, in order to be efficient, needs to be done. Uh, this also connects with the need to be compliant and implement safeguards and also these enforcement obligations. And here also to conclude, I would like to bring two points that are very necessary to take into account. When we are talking about the UAI Act, we are talking about regulation of standards and product safety. So it's a technical regulation. Whereas in GDPR, we are talking about the protection of personal data. And look, if we go back, when we were talking about the, 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 the human rights that were breached, we were talking about private life and non-discrimination. Do you see the connection? I strongly see this connection between the interplay of GDPR and UAAT. And this research, uh, how these two big regulations interplay in the reality is going to be key for scholars, for institutions, for private sector, for everybody. So this focus needs to be done in our research. And also, another key is that legal uh, scholars, philosophers, engineers, computer scientists really understand the impact of the regulation and what we are regulating. So hopefully we will avoid the situations of non-discrimination and we will be able to offer a assistance that really comply with fundamental rights. Thank you so much. And if you need anything else, I remain at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for Laura. Now the um, uh, stage is to uh, Inessa Stolper, PhD candidate from Nicholas Remaris University. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and contribute to ongoing academic uh, discourse on the topic of AI and justice. Um, in a way, my presentation is going to summarize what we've heard today, but from a slightly different uh, perspective. It is also kind of a fashion of today to begin from a story, and I will be not an exception. I will start from a story, if I can. Let me try. Okay. So um, a few months ago, um, there was this uh, situation when a judge from the US appeal court used generative artificial intelligence, ChatGPT in particular, to discover the ordinary meaning of the term landscaping. Uh, the judge um, actually wrote a concurring opinion, 10 or nine pages more or less, uh, describing his experience and also included prompts. Um, I would like to reference to a passage from this concurring opinion, which nicely serves as an introduction to my talk today. So the judge wrote, and I quote here, might large language models be useful in the interpretation of legal texts? Having initially thought the idea positively ludicrous, I think I now a pretty firm 
maybe. At the very least, it seems to me uh, it's an issue worth exploring. So this is what I'm planning to do in the next eight minutes, is to explore this issue through three questions. Okay, I'm also being a victim of um, incompatibility of technology today. So uh, could AI be used in the court? Should AI be used in the court? Or better not? So the first question could be, or could AI be used in the courts? And this is in essence a legal question. Are there any legal barriers for introduction of artificial intelligence uh, in the courts and tribunals? And typically I would go to the topic of right to fair trial. This is the primary focus of my research. But for today I will just um, list three documents here which were designed to specifically regulate artificial intelligence. So the first one we know very well, EU regulation on artificial intelligence, which includes uh, uh, use of AI in, uh, in justice system as a high risk environment, I would rather say. Uh, Council of Europe recently adopted the Convention on Artificial Intelligence, which provides a framework for regulating AI, mostly addressing human rights risks and democratic values. And UNESCO is working as we speak on the draft guidelines for the use of AI systems in courts and tribunals. So what all these three documents share in common? None of them prohibit the use of artificial intelligence in courts and tribunals. And the question is why? And I came up with two reasons why. Uh, the first one, uh, at least EU regulation on artificial intelligence, distinguishes or differentiates between the use of artificial intelligence for administrative purposes in the court, such as writing letters, uh, working with the court transcripts, proofreading, what's wrong with that? It's probably not against the right uh, to fair trial. And the use of AI for interpretation of facts and law, which is more critical. Another reason is potentially, potentially there could be advantages why AI should be used in the court. And this brings me to my second question. If AI can, be, can bring positive changes to justice system, maybe it should be used in the court. And normally when we start considering use of technology in the court, Way back then, it was the same discussion about email services, communication with the courts, electronic communication system, remote hearings, and now artificial intelligence. So all these um, technologies, they have to help to solve one of the issues we have in the court. And this was already presented uh, today. Accessibility, delays, consistency, costs, these are the struggles everywhere in the world. So can AI help you with these issues? I'm going to drop three examples. I uh, don't have time to uh, go into detail, but hopefully they will demonstrate that actually AI can contribute positively to justice system. So the first one is accessibility, and this is my favorite topic. I think there is a great pot potential where AI can be used out of court for explaining people their rights, obligations sometimes, helping people to draft uh, a claim, self-representative uh, lit litigants to the court, help with, at the negotiation and mediation stage, and we have a real example where the system was implemented already a few years ago and people are very happy. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of work about providing legal information. Every, anybody who tried ChatGPT, it has this cute feature where you can ask ChatGPT to explain complex notions as to five-year-old. So this is something that we can also do for citizens, that they understand their rights better because some legislative acts impossible to understand if you don't have a legal background and even if you do. So decreased delays, and yes, I'm going to speak about automation of simple cases here. No, I'm not claiming that the judge should be outside of the loop. The judge should be inside of the loop and check the, uh, the uh, automated decision-making systems. Human oversight is a very important element for me. 
but maybe we still consider to automate some of the simple cases which are repetitive, technical in nature, doesn't need to have an extensive interpretation of law or facts. Consistency, uh, this is a very interesting example because this is what AI is best of to a certain extent uh, to identify patterns and it can serve as a kind of a advanced research tool. So if we agree, let's agree for a second that AI is more positive than negative and we decided to implement it in the core, how it should be done. At this moment, there are two ways how you can do this. You can al allow the court staff to use so-called public AI. Public AI, this is ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, brothers and sisters of these systems. One of the prominent examples is United Kingdom, which issued guidance in 2023, allowing the court staff, including judges, to use uh, ChatGPT in their work, with some, of course, warning. Another way is to design a specifically tailored system for the courts. And I'm a little bit in favor of the second option, and here are why. Well, firstly, we can fine tune the artificial intelligence system for specifically dedicated to the court tasks. Secondly, we can check the quality of the data set. Anybody knows, I think everybody knows here that ChatGPT was trained on all sort of information from the internet where the uh, quality of these data sets are arguable or questionable. If we fine tune a system for the court, we can train it on the legislation, case law, court practice, doctrine of a specific country, and arguably it can uh, improve in accuracy. Uh, there are all sort of researches on this in this area. It is improving concerning hallucinations and what kind of output it produces. Still some work to be done, but it's possible that it will improve in the future. And of course, test, testing and oversight. Or maybe what I'm talking about today is absolutely ludicrous, that it's impossible. You know, um, it's a bit difficult to address this topic. Uh, for me, I'm technology positive person, as you could already figure it out. But I do agree with everything what was said today about risks and challenges, and I'm not naive. I know I uh, recognize that these challenges, the real risks and real examples of bad uh, examples exist in the world. So bias, hallucination, technological over-reliance was very much nicely covered by Julia today. Uh, and all these issues were discussed at length, maybe caused uh, VC benefit was not uh, present as a topic of today. What I'm meaning here, if we're going to design a specifically tailored AI system for the court, this is going to be a costly exercise. It will cost money. And eventually it will be the question whether it brings benefit, whether it uh, benefit outweighs the uh, designing of such system for the court. So. Here, at this point, I will conclude, and I will just answer my question, are we ready for AI? I think not quite yet. Uh, firstly, because technology is not perfect at this point, and secondly, I think we are not perfect at this uh, moment yet. I believe here, the group uh, in this conference are quite familiar uh, with AI, but we are a bigger society, judges, lawyers, students who are studying right now. And I think what is really important, what we, ca we can focus on, since we cannot develop or program the systems, we can focus on AI literacy skills, that we do understand uh, the systems better, and we know what kind of risks uh, we can face in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And <laughs> if any questions, please, please approach me. Thank you, Nessa, very much for your speech. Now um, we are inviting Artura Sugrumulaitis, PhD candidate from Vilnius University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. 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 Yeah, please.
So hello everyone, uh, dear colleagues and dear guests of the conference. I'm glad to be here and uh, conclude our panel. I think uh, these 10, 12 minutes uh, you will be able to, to hear concentrated. Uh, and uh, I will present my uh, research on topic navigating AI regulation, re regulation addressing uh, liability for defective AI systems. So first question is why we need the new AI regulation. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the first uh, very important uh, accent uh, or moment is that uh, uh, we have the transition uh, from the discriminative AI uh, to the generative AI. Uh, and uh, according to the open AI uh, data, uh, the G G chat GPT version 01 exceeds human PhD uh, accuracy in a lot of files. So, so in f f physics, in biology, and uh, al already chemistry. Uh, so technological progress, uh, progress brings to, to the society the positive uh, aspects and uh, helps to, to, to boost creativity and to increase the productivity. Uh, but uh, we also uh, should mention that uh, a second important thing, because the regulation is needed, uh, is actually uh, specific risks that AI systems uh, bring uh, to us, and what are these specific risks? So, uh, first of all, hallucinations. We know about the, the very fresh case, uh, uh, New York Times versus Microsoft and OpenAI. Uh, deepfakes, uh, that, 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 that's already around us. Uh, Hyper-realistic videos, uh, also copyright infringements, and already uh, 29 different cases around the world uh, we have this uh, unauthorized use of uh, works in AI training uh, sets. Other risks, for example, like discrimination uh, through AI bias, violation of privacy, manipulation, and uh, cybersecurity issues. Uh, so all these, all, all, all these uh, uh, aspects bring us to the new AI regulation. And what is the, the main purpose of this regulation? Is of course to balance uh, the uh, AI risk that the new technology bring to us and the uh, customer uh, protection or protection of individual rights. Uh, when we speak about the, uh, the regulation model, uh, sometimes the scholars uh, took only the one part of that. So I, I, I wanted to show you what is the regulation model. So we have actually two parts. One part is uh, ex ante, uh, uh, that's uh, safety regulations uh, that is covered by AI Act and covers usually the, uh, the, the, the protection uh, of uh, healthy and safety risk and also the uh, risk for fundamental rights. And the second part is actually exposed measures uh, that are liability rules covered by uh, AI liability directive and product liability directive that it's already revised now. Uh, so the, the, uh, the aim of uh, of my research was to see uh, to this proposed uh, AI regulation model, uh, to these two, two, three documents, and actually to, uh, to analyze the limitations and legal challenges uh, that this new regulation model gives and uh, to propose some uh, effective liability allocation uh, uh, proposals. Uh, if we see at the uh, first part at, at, at these ex ante measures of safety regulations, uh, we can see some advantages uh, why this regulation as, as such is needed. Uh, and you see here uh, five, but at least uh, a lot of, of, of benefits we can see, but, but at least these five. Uh, so, so the, uh, the more uh, regulation is more efficient than stored liability, because it gives clear expectations to the customers. Uh, in, 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 
uh, in opposite the total ability for example uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's it has difficult causation it has a long litigation process uh, so benef uh, regulations also uh, benefits uh, of proactive regulation. So we have a clear set of safety standards, we have a clear uh, list of uh, risk categories. Uh, also safety regulation has disadvantage that uh, uh, we can harmonize it globally. So some, uh, some AI act uh, uh, risk-based approach is used in US uh, and uh, uh, Canada and other countries, so it could be harmonized globally. Uh, it's also very important to say that uh, 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 customer protection uh, through, uh, uh, through, through the regulation is better because uh, it, uh, uh, it's before the market entry. So each system, if you create and, and if it uh, goes uh, to the regulation part, so we must uh, uh, check it before the market entry. And it also creates confidence in technology for the customers. Uh, and the last one, uh, it regu clear regulation promotes uh, responsible innovation. So, so the, the meaning is that uh, uh, regulation seeks uh, that technology are not only uh, advanced, but also safe and reliable. Uh, when we see people speak about the second part, about the liability rules, why, why it's better to have the liability rules in the, in the, in the uh, uh, AI regulation model, uh, we, we see here also some advantages. So, uh, so people uh, may not always follow the regulations, so we can create a lot of different uh, standards, but the people and the companies sometimes uh, doing what they want. Uh, uh, liability is also more efficient by unknown risk. So if we have not uh, not known risk that we can put in the AI Act, so we can use better liability rules as an ex ante uh, solution. That means that, that we have the, the damage already and we, we, we use the liability rules to, 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 to compensate it. Uh, also, regulation updates take the time. We, we see how long it took uh, to uh, to, to, to make uh, updates in AI Act, so from 2021 until uh, this year, so three years, uh, uh, changes and, and, and improvements. Uh, from this part, liability rules are, are more advantage. Uh, and uh, regulations can also be too strong or too weak. Uh, so sometimes we overregulate the things and sometimes we're not, uh, not enough regulating it. And uh, of course, the complexity of, of regulation uh, of AI Act, uh, with these six, 700 pages, we understand that uh, liability rules with uh, AI directive or PLD with 20 pages is even uh, a simpler solution for that. Uh, so other limitations of this regulation model I see that, that uh, the, for example, safety regulation has limitation that, that it focuses on risks, not on benefits uh, analysis. Uh, also, possibilities for double regulation. We have, uh, 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 for example, medical device regulation, or we have GDPR, and sometimes uh, AI Act covers or, or, or double regulates some areas. Uh, also, very broad definition we have uh, AI uh, in the AI Act. Uh, it's it's uh, in in the previous version it was very very clear what we mean uh, under AI system. Now it's uh, more or less each software <laughs> integrated AI uh, could be uh, defined as 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 AI system. Uh, as I said, and, and also complexity of AI Act is is the limitation. A limitation by tort liability, uh, it's of course this difficult uh, difficult causation or multiple causation. If we have the, the damage caused by AI product or AI system, uh, to use the liability uh, rules, we, we, we should have all these uh, uh, fear, uh, for, for conditions uh, for civil responsibility. And one of that is the causation, and usually is the multiple causation who is uh, who caused the, the, the damage. 
Uh, also, uh, its its uh, uh, limit, uh, limitation is that uh, uh, EU member states they have different uh, liability rules because they are usually regulated of a local uh, uh, legislation, and in different uh, jurisdictions we have di different view. Uh, so, to, uh, uh, I, because of, of, of the time limit, I choose only two uh, big or biggest challenges what I see from, from, uh, from all the research. So, the first very, very big uh, challenge, uh, as I see, that it's uh, the harmonization challenge. Uh, uh, because uh, these two documents, AI Liability Directive and Product Liability Directive, they are directive, they will be, will be transposed to national law in different, different possible ways. And on the screen you see the sample with the old PLD, how it was uh, transposed, uh, transposed the, the, the definition of the product. And in Austria, it was movable physical thing. In Ireland, it was all movables. In Lithuania, even uh, movable things and uh, some services. So, so I, f I see this challenge for the new uh, directive, uh, how we will transpose it uh, in the national law. And, uh, and, and if we transpose it differently, then we have a, a less efficient uh, version of the, of the working liability rules. Uh, the second, uh, second challenge I see also this uh, synchronization of definitions. We have different directives and, and similar terms, but in different meanings. So we can find uh, product and digital services uh, and digital content and goods with digital elements. So, so around, uh, around the digitalization, we have different uh, terms. And it would be good that at least in this uh, AI model, at least in these three documents, we have uh, aligned the terms that, that to, to avoid the misunderstanding. Okay, and short to conclude, uh, uh, I think the, the, this, this rapid uh, development of AI technology brings a lot of advantages to us, uh, but, but also brings a lot of uh, ethical and legal challenges. Uh, and it's, it's of course due to, 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 due to the complexity, opacity, autonomy of AI systems. And uh, when we think about the uh, regulation model as, as such, we, we uh, should think about all these characteristics uh, uh, that uh, uh, to balance this uh, innovation question and customer protection. Uh, in, in my opinion, when we speak about AI regulation model, we, uh, uh, we should uh, use both. Uh, it means liability rules and regulation rules together, uh, despite some limitations, but we cannot work with only ex ante uh, instruments or ex post. So, so we cannot work uh, after damage is happening or everything covered with the regulation in advance. So, so we should combine all these two, uh, two parts uh, in, in the model and always see uh, as, as, a, as a wall package. So some, some scholars take only one part and analyzing this. I think uh, the, the, the main issue is that we should analyze as, as a wall, wall package. Uh, and of course, tort liability is generally more, more uh, ef ef effective if the risks are well known uh, and regulation uh, in these places that we can uh, describe it in the, in the, in the act, for example. Uh, and as I mentioned, as a two uh, two challenges that I see, and we should start from them. That's a transposition challenge that we really work in Europe uh, to transpose to transpose the norm in the same in the same level that we can use, for example, AI products uh, both in Lithuania, these problems in France or Germany that we not have this this fragmentation of the liability uh, norms and also align the definitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Arturi. Now the last our presentation for our conference organizers is um, 
Neringa Gaubinė and Kristina Pranevičia from Vilnius University Law Faculty. Last, but I hope not the least. Our presentation is last in this day's session, and uh, civil enforcement uh, is the last stage of civil proceedings. So today, I would like to start my presentation with a compelling question. Will AI replace bailiffs and enforcement officers? Artificial intelligence transformed various sectors uh, by enhancing efficiency, accuracy, and productivity. As we already uh, heard, the justice system is not an exception. Uh, as we delve into the topic, let's consider both the potential and the limitation of AI. For sure, bail bailiffs and enforcement officers are responsible for serving legal documents, enforcing court orders and executing uh, warrants. These tasks requires not only deep understanding of legal procedures, but also strong interpersonal skills, the ability to manage conflicts, and crucially, human judgment. AI can undoubtedly assist in many admin administrative aspects and tasks, for instance. AI systems can efficiently manage and track court documents, schedule hearings, uh, and uh, even predict case outcomes based on historical data. However, the replacement of bailiffs and enforcement agents and officers by AI is a complex issue. One of the main challenges is the human element. According to the website, uh, uh, will robot uh, take my job? The risk of automation impacting the role of bailiff is moderate. However, it's very real that AI will change th this profession. And uh, let's analyze how. What is e-enforcement, digital enforcement? Uh, digital enforcement or e-enforcement refers to the application of digital technologies to the process of enforcing court decision. This includes the use of online platforms, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technologies. The goal is to streamline and enhance the enforcement process, make it faster, more efficient, transparent, and pleasant to use. Uh, we can see uh, many international standards and uh, cooperations in this area, but uh, I would like to go deep into global code of digital enforcement. On the 8th of uh, December 2021, International Union of Bailiffs and Judici Judicial Officers adopted the global code of digital enforcement to improve civil digital enforcement and set the higher global standards uh, for judicial officers. It encouraged both national and international regulation of digital enforcement process, even if the code is not mandatory. It is recommended that universal principles outlined in, in it be incorporated in the national legislation governing the use of digital technologies in enforcement. The code encompasses uh, procedures for enforcement and the recovery of digital assets, including the use of artificial intelligence and blockchain technology. Uh, Lacun, a French-American computer scientist working primarily in the field of machine learning, 
in 2018 told that machines are still very, very stupid. The smartest AI system today has less common sense than a house cat. But today we see that AI systems show emergent capabilities that we did not add it when developing these systems. How it can benefit for e-enforcement? As we can see, all the benefits, increasing efficiency, enhanced accuracy, improved asset detection recovery, cost saving, enhanced decision making, and many more that we mentioned pre in previous presentations, so I won't go deeper. It also applies to the e-enforcement and the, all the civil enforcement process. So let's take a look closer to the current situation in Lithuania. In Lithuania, the enforcement process is highly advanced due to the excessive application of digital technologies. Following the inst uh, institutional reform in 2003, which um, transitioned the state court bailiff system to private bailiffs, significant progress has been made. The legal framework for, use, uh, for the use of digital technologies is enforcement is established in the Code of Civil Procedure and the law of bailiffs. These laws mandate that all enforcement cases and related information be processed and stored digitally. This includes digitalizing all incoming and ongoing written information and providing remote access to the digital files for involved parties and stakeholders. Key digital tools in Lithuania it's a bailiff information system, an essential component of Lithuanian digital enforcement process in the bailiffs is the bailiff's information system. It automates numerous bailiff's activities, streamlines data exchange, and integrates with various reg reg registers and, da uh, and uh, data providers. Then, cash registration information system, introduced in 2015, represents another significant milestone. Chris automates the restriction and write-off of the funds from debtor accounts, ensuring prompt and proportional distribution of uh, collected funds. And electronic auction. Electronic tenders and auctions have also improved the efficiency and transparency of the enforcement process. All auctions are now conducted electronically in Lithuania. So future perspectives in Lithuania. In summary, while Lithuania's enforcement process is highly digitalized and advanced, it is currently focused on automation only. The next step involves integrating advanced digital technologies and such uh, artificial intelligence. The suggested idea would be digital file management system, tools that allow files to be stored, managed, and view digital format, facilitating information retrieval and access to bailiff's office staff. Then artificial intelligence and data ana anal uh, analytics. AI can be used to analyze that data, address legal issues, predict decisions, or even automate certain process. Biometric identification. Biometric solutions such as fingerprint, facial recognition, or other biometric data can be used to ensure the identity of individual. And, of course, chatbots. An opportunity to facilitate the work of bailiffs. These could be the future perspective of uh, e-enforcement in Lithuania. Another quote. Artificial intelligence is a tool, not a threat. And it's crucial to critically analyze the challenges that arise in the re uh, realm of e-enforcement. Challenges, challenges also were discussed uh, in previous uh, presentations, so da data privacy and security, bias and fairness, transparency and accountability, legal and regulatory issues. I won't go deeper to this. And I would like to invite my colleague, Christina, to continue our presentation. 
Okay, so thank you, Naringa. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be the last speaker. Uh, you are amazing audience and so patient, so listening. So um, I will not torture you for long. Uh, I will just uh, proceed with some aspects of challenges while we use AI. We want to use AI in the recovery from digital assets in this procedure. Uh, we want to make uh, sure the bailiffs might know how to use it, uh, how it can be helpful, how it can be um, uh, in, in the hands safely. So uh, first of all, proceeding to talk about what uh, Neringa has already mentioned, uh, I think that uh, quality of data is uh, one of the most crucial elements uh, while we are talking about um, the usage of EAI. And uh, the quality of data might be um, described by six elements. Uh, you can see those in the slides. So uh, first of all, of course, we have we have to have the complete data. Uh, the completeness of data means that uh, if we anticipate a quality result, so we have to present the complete data for our AI assistant if we want it to, to be helpful. Uh, another crucial element of data quality is timeliness. You can see number two. Uh, so timeliness and data quality refers to the relevance and availability of data at the right moment. Uh, it assesses whether data is current, uh, up to date, uh, and accessible when needed for decision making or analysis or finding out what uh, digital assets uh, debtor has, what cryptocurrencies account um, are at his or her disposal, and so on. So. Um, and this is very important. Uh, timeliness is also crucial because of relevance. Uh, data must be recent enough to accurately reflect the current situation or context. Because, uh, you know, outdated information can lead to very poor decisions and very poor outcomes. Let me give, me, let me give you one example. Uh, for example, you can um, imagine a bailiff um, executing the court's order which awards the creditor some digital assets. Uh, the bailiff has to know exactly that the data he or she has is relevant to date of the enforcement. This means that uh, if, for example, cryptocurrency was withdrawn from the crypto bank account, there is nothing to be recovered, actually. So uh, this uh, element of data is absolutely important. Uh, another important thing while talking about timeliness is uh, accessibility, uh, which means that uh, timely data should be readily available when required, ensuring that uh, users can access it immediately without any delays. It is also very important, and this causes most problems with the fact that there is no national or international register of digital assets yet. Um, even cryptocurrencies are not registered, cryptocurrencies account. It depends actually on what information is uh, mm, accessible for the bailiff. So this depends also on the fairness of the debtors and um, this may bring uh, most of the issues, challenges and um, misunderstandings even. Um, even if the bailiff probably can get access to um, particular cryptocurrency account, uh, for example, if it is in Revolut or other bank account, uh, it is uh, quite easily can be uh, accessed and uh, uh, checked uh, by the bailiff. This does not mean that it is easy to access all the digital assets, which might be worldwide actually, and which might be really owned by the debtor. So it is evident that delayed or outdated data can hinder effective decision making, leading to some missed opportunities to recover from cryptocurrencies, from digital assets, and so on. So overall, maintaining high timeliness and data quality would help us to respond quickly to changes and make informed decisions. Wherefore, we do suggest that uh, um, we need to establish the register very soon, 
at least at the national, national level. Uh, thirdly, you can see that validity of data is also very important. Uh, this is also for several reasons. First of all, accurate decision making, because uh, valid data ensures us that conclusions drawn from it are based on sound evidence. Uh, this is also very essential for effective decision making in any organization, and especially while we are talking about the enforcement of court's judgments. Uh, compliance and legal issues, bailiffs of, of course are subject to uh, pretty strict regulations. As you know, uh, there, is, there are laws mm, regulating bailiffs' um, mm, acts and so on. Uh, they require accurate data reporting as well because the bailiff has to give, mm, is accountant for the creditor what was done, what, what cannot be done, and so on. So uh, invalid data can lead to non-compliance, resulting some even legal penalties and uh, reputational damage for the bailiff if he or she fails to comply with legal issues. So in summary, ensuring the validity of data is fundamental to optimizing operations and achieving strategic goals. In this case, the efficient recovery from digital assets, uh, mostly from cryptocurrencies. Uh, the fourth element is uh, integrity. And uh, also this uh, feature of quality is uh, vital for several reasons. Uh, first of all, trustworthiness corresponds to the fact that data integrity ensures that information is reliable and accurate, fostering trust among the persons who participate in the enforcement and recovery procedures. Um, consistency means that high data integrity means uh, remains um, across different systems and data sets, and uh, this also can secure the accurate results. Uh, decision making is another part of integrity, and uh, as I mentioned before, decisions based on quality data are with high integrity and are more likely to be sound, rational, and good. Um, risk mitigation means that high integrity helps the bailiffs to identify and assess risks accurately, allowing for better risk management and response strategies. This means that if, for instance, we have a register, we can avoid those risks. Fifth uh, element is uniqueness. Uh, it is also important for several reason, really reasons. It can help to eliminate duplicates, also to provide clear, accurate representation of information. Uh, it is also uh, a unique record, simplify data management, reduce the complexity of data handling, and in summary, ensures uh, data quality. Lastly, sixth element is consistency. Uh, so first of all, consistent data provides stable foundation for decision making. Uh, uh, when data is consistent across different sources and systems, it enhances the reliability of reports and analysis, ensuring that participants receive the same information. Uh, consistent data also reduces time and effort required to reconcile discrepancies, streamlining operations, and minimizing errors in workflows. So in summary, data consistency is fundamental to ensuring that data quality and ensuring information is reliable, trustworthy, and usable. Uh, so uh, yes, I know uh, the time is, uh, uh, is up. Um, I will not uh, explain so broadly about algorithms. Uh, the president of AI today, Linus Petkatch, has explained it pretty well. <laughs> I, will, I think we will also proceed with discussions, but yes, algorithms uh, can be uh, given to the AI. AI produces interpretations even now for today, so this is very important. Another challenge is uh, interpretable versus explainable. Machine learning, uh, how do you think? Is it interpretable or explainable? Uh, we can also discuss this um, uh, during uh, probably the next day. Uh, yes, I would I would would be preferred to talk about scalability, but uh, I will move to to my last slide. 
because uh, if we are sometimes choosing the path, uh, so where to go, ethical or legal way, or maybe somewhere to the middle. Uh, legal and ethical cons considerations can sometimes be faced also in the recovery procedure, not only in uh, making judgments. So the use of AI in recovery processes may raise legal issues, especially concerning ownership and rights related to digital assets. So this may cause some legal ethical considerations. Uh, so for instance, the AI might incorrectly identify a legitimate use of digital assets. Mo one might uh, tell, especially a lawyer might tell, uh, that um, legal solution is easy. Uh, but uh, is an ethical solu solution easy? And especially, is it easy to uh, have a solution this is the, which is ethical and legal? Uh, that is why we should discuss and to achieve that goal, to try to achieve that goal without any violations of human rights, without any um, hallucinations <laughs> of the AI. And uh, I think that uh, you would all agree with me or similarly like, like us with Naringa answer this question. Will AI replace bailiffs and uh, enforcement offices? What do you think? Any ideas? Any opinions? Will it be? Will it be soon? Will it be in, in, in a year or two? Or, 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 or <laughs> no, we think no. Uh, the answer is no because uh, me and Nerica, Neringa, we think that bailiffs and enforcement officers will be replaced by other professionals who know and are able to use AI. Because like it was mentioned today, every AI is an assistant of a human. We are human, so we have to know how to use the AI wisely. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for being so patient. If you have questions, you can very quickly yes. give them. Please, if, yes, thank you very much for Christina. And because it is our last presentator, maybe you have questions, because now it is the time to ask. Do you have? No, no time. Neringa is showing no time. So I am saying for you that the first day of the conference now is finishing. And uh, have a nice evening. Uh, we will meet tomorrow, yes? And uh, I don't know. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I will explain uh, if you have some one minute of patience. <laughs> so while closing the first day of this outstanding conference, um, I want to share some few thoughts with you. We are all seeking for judicial efficiency. We are all seeking for enforcement of judgments efficiency. And today we anticipate so much that the AI will help us. Uh, as it was mentioned today by the AI Association President, we are on our way to understand that the math formulas enable the AI to generate even interpretive answers, uh, which gives uh, us inspirations, as was mentioned by Dr. Alexandra Klich. So the Pandora's box is open now today, and we are on the way to quick digitaliz digitalization procedures. So. The most important thing is that humans have to make sure that AI is used ethically, without any violations, and wisely. So one of the most impressive words I have heard today, that uh, AI might be biased or even hallucinating sometimes. So this means that we have to be very careful to identify that. And uh, mm, we see already today, worldwide, Judges already are using AI while giving judgments. So uh, is it good or is it bad? So we do not have yet in Lithuania such practice, but uh, it might come soon. I think that we are thinking today about justice with the help of the AI. So firstly, we have to keep in mind that AI has to be human-centric. So uh, first day, of this outstanding conference has opened the door 
for further discussions about the human-centric AI, and I would like to thank our Faculty of Law for hosting such a, an amazing event, um, second time. Uh, I would like to thank our Dean uh, Harold Shinkunas. I would like to thank our Vice Deans uh, Vigita Vebrite and Jurgita Pujaita Kulvinskene. Also, uh, I would like to thank um, all those people who were very eager to help with the organizational issues. And the most important, uh, thanks Neringa Gubiana for, <laughs> yes, applause please, for your big effort and big input in um, asking everyone to come to share their thoughts, their researches. And uh, thank you all for participations, for curious listening, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. <laughs>